All right, so welcome to the JavaScript functional panel. I had to look up there just to make sure that I remembered the name of the panel. Um, I'm Brian Lonsdorf. Uh, I guess we're just going to go down and introduce ourselves really quick. So, Phil? Sure. Uh, I'm Phil Freeman. Um, I work on the PureScript compiler and its libraries. So I'm Evan Draplicki. I designed Elm programming language and work on that, uh, make a nice functional language for browsers at no red ink. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lee Byron. I work at Facebook on React, Immutable.js, and GraphQL. Hello, my name is Hardy Jones. Uh, I'm not as cool as these guys, but I, I'm a big language nerd, so I like all languages, PureScript, Elm, Haskell, JavaScript, whatever. Yes. So we've, I hope we have a good mixed crew of people here. We're going to talk about uh, functional JavaScript uh, and functional programming and uh, just kind of in general. We don't have any closure scripters, so if anybody has any questions that they want to ask later uh, in that regard, let me know um, by just shouting out or something. All right, so I'm going to start this off by saying, um, so functional programming used to be like the cell was a few years ago. They were like, the future is parallel, and you have to be functional if you're going to be parallel. I don't know if I like buy that so much anymore. Maybe I do, uh, but I feel like there's a lot better cells. What, what is uh, what's everybody's take on that? Do you want to start, Phil? Like, what's the cell of functional programming if not parallelism? Sure. So I think um, for me, the the strength. I mean, I think parallelism is a is a great cell still. Um, although I think you know it, it, it takes a little bit um, of effort to sort of see. Um, it's not immediately obvious why that's. Uh, why that's the case, it's sort of more obvious to me. Uh, something like building domain-specific languages. Uh, let's say I have a, a complex problem domain, um, and I want to, uh, you know, express ideas succinctly and some, you know, reduce the set of ideas and, and express, you know, build build things up, build ideas up succinctly in this domain-specific language. That's always been like the way I've sold FP to people. Well, so I I saw the the story was like oh concurrency parallelism a couple years ago, and I think that makes sense if you look at the sort of historical trend, right? So a place where sort of functional con con fun functional concepts become nice when your application starts to like crumble beneath you and you're like, oh, is there a better way to do this? Um, and so when you see people who have these massive distributed systems and they're like, this is not working out for me, it, it makes sense to me that uh, that happened a bit earlier. And I, I think uh, we're starting to see that more in front of where people are saying, oh, we can bring in these concepts to solve these problems we know we have. Whereas on server, it was just like, everything's broken. Like, what if it wasn't, right? And it hadn't gotten to a point where JavaScript was like, huh. Sure. Um, but for me, uh, a lot of the important piece is just, how can we simplify the process of getting to a good uh, product? So it's not really about functional programming or particular sort of pieces of it, but just like we have this paradigm that sort of simplifies, simplifies your process to get to a good product. Right, that's uh, I totally buy that. <laughs> I think, uh, most people are starting to see like immutability is is the way. They're like writing object oriented code, all immutable and stuff. And uh, immutable JS is getting really popular. And you know I think every every work like every enterprise job I'm seeing now is starting to adopt that. So that's really cool. Um, that and type safety. Um, so it's hard to separate uh, functional programming from types unless you're doing closure. And even then they're starting to add types <laughs> or Lisp. Um, so I, I, I wondered um, for JavaScripters, uh, what what uh, you know what the, can they do right now with the type tools they have, and how does that compare to what you can do? I can toss in some because I spent some time working on Flow, which is right a type checker that we're working on at Facebook. Um, and to go back to your original question, like what is it about functional programming that seems so enticing? Uh, I think the parallelism was like a nice early sell, but parallelism is an outcome of the true values that you get, and the value is simplicity and composability. And when you have those two features, kind of regardless of how you implement that or how you achieve those two things, all kinds of other things come about as well. Yeah, and it just so happens that distributed systems are really hard. It just so happens that like, <laughs> when you have really hard problems, having very simple composable pieces to assemble to solve hard problems turns out to be a much better way to solve them than like throwing the complexity wall at the problem and seeing what shakes out. Uh, and type systems, like I think this is another example, and it's, like, it's also an outcome similar to you know, how do you make distributed systems better. We've been trying to apply type systems to programming languages for decades. 
um, in both functional environments and non-functional environments. But I think what we've proven to ourselves is that if you like look at any Java program that has a type system, it just it sucks. Like there's all these places you're like, eh, cast to object and like carry on. You're like, what is it doing for me really? And the nice thing about a functional environment is because you have things that are composable, types want a composable environment in the first place. So typing ends up being just a much easier thing to solve when you have like very simple, very composable pieces. And you can do that in JavaScript today. Like if you write simple, uh, immutable, functional, kind of components that are designed to compose together, then the type checking tools that we have for JavaScript end up being way more powerful than if you don't use that kind of programming technique. And this has, I think, been a big factor in sort of the uptake of type stuff is that when people, a lot of people think types, they think types in Java, and they just forget to say in Java. And so like the fact that they have emotions about that is it, now like my problem. You know, um, and so like I can say, hey, you know, it's different this time. But but like you, the, there is this sort of built-in distrust that sort of this historical relic. So and I think that's starting to change just because people are getting yeah. JavaScript applications that are big enough where they're just like, this is collapsing in on itself. How do I? And type systems have kind of been on the, f the fringe for a while, right? Like, you kind of foray in and you hear things. You're like, oh, my, my software is going to be provably correct. It's like, no, it's not. Like, unless you're using some very specific programming techniques and environments, like, you, so, don't, and, you and won't have provably correct programs and they, they with have, zero bugs. In those environments, there are jokes like, you know, I proved it's correct, but I don't know if it actually works. <laughs> it, it's <laughs> right? it's so proved like, to be correct, but it doesn't run. Yeah. Well, but, like, like, you have to be careful. Like, did you actually prove Did you prove the right you thing? Thought? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So. I, I don't. I don't tend to like that framing. Like for me, what it, it's it, like when I I made a like type inferred functional language. But the point isn't I like types. The point is I really like to be able to refactor in a certain way. So when I remove a function, it's nice to me that I can just say here are the four places that are affected. Or when I add something to an API, I know that it has to be handled in all these other places. And so it's that sort of static automated help that I find really valuable. And a lot of times I feel like we get stuck talking about types, but it, that's kind of the way to getting this nice outcome in practice. Totally, well, yeah, I mean, a type system can be, a good, a good type system should be a tool for sort of managing complexity, right? But I think it's important to remember that, and this goes with like, you know, like you say, like managing modules and, and other kinds of problems that like, simple types can actually be incredibly valuable as well, even if it's something as simple as, can I distinguish an email address from a phone number as two strings, right? Um, yeah. And I think part of what's sort of held up functional stuff like this taking off is both you have the Java side of things where people don't trust it, and then you have the people who are really into sort of the mechanism that makes it all work, and you get this this like avenue of communication that doesn't make any sense. For some people are saying like I don't trust this, and other people are saying if you just get extremely obsessed about the details, <laughs> like it'll make sense. But like the real story is. Like we want your application to work better. <laughs> yeah, Hardy, you've you've done stuff in like crazy hardcore type stuff like PureScript, and then also like JavaScript. And like, how do you feel like your programming differs and their safety feels and stuff? I think when you're using JavaScript, you have to pay a lot more attention to everything that's going on. Whereas if you have a compiler like PureScript, you can dish off a lot of the cognitive load to that and encode different things in the type system. Like Phil was saying, you can differentiate between like an email and some other type of string. So you don't really have to like have all these checks inside your code. It just kind of fits together one way, you know. And right. one thing I've noticed along these lines is as I've sort of gotten into functional stuff, it very much changed how I write JavaScript or Java or C or, or whatever it happens to be. But the thing is, is that even knowing how I ideally would write it, I still can't seem to achieve that often. So like there's a part of Elm stuff that's got a big JavaScript piece, and I'm like, I have these architecture principles, and I'm not gonna stray from them. And then I get to the end, and I'm like, what did I do? How did this happen to me? You know what I mean? Like, so the, the, and the, I, I don't know. I'm I'm still quite perplexed by that. Like I I don't know how to how to get around that yet. But. So I had a, another follow-up question here um, about kind of mixed paradigm. Um, you know, we're in. In JavaScript in particular, or Scala, or Swift, there's a lot of uh, mixed paradigm language. Even F-sharp came out as a revolution when they, they first announced that. 
Uh, but uh, I was curious how, what your thoughts were. I kind of felt like, I feel it's a little awkward to mix object-oriented stuff and functional stuff um, you know, in general, but uh, maybe there's a way we just haven't found yet. Um, does anybody have thoughts? Also, I, I have talked with some Scala people about this kind of stuff, and my feeling is, in some ways, it's like the ultimate learning curve, but it has uh, issues, right? So you can be three years into writing Scala code and really just be writing Java code with some local type inference. Right. Like, that's an avenue that's open to you. And so in some sense, Scala isn't really giving you the whole promise of these nice things. But on the other hand, the learning curve was, I just have to write less code, and I get what I, I was doing before. So you have this extraordinarily gradual, easy to manage learning curve that I think is really powerful. So I don't, it, yeah, so, so you have this, this flip side of like, we can get people to come, but we can't convince them to like, it's hard to know if you don't know if you're using it correctly. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> I remember when I first started doing functional programming, I was like, I think I'm doing it right. And then like, you know, of course, I'm using Compose all the time, perfect. But yeah, it's definitely, uh, you kind of get it after a while, but Mixed Paradigm makes that interesting. And I don't know if other people experience this way, but like one of the things that sort of has driven my understanding of programming and how to put large things together is just using languages that are like force me to do things that I'm not comfortable with. Right, so like when I first learned uh, Scheme, I was like, wow, like something new and crazy is happening here. And, and that sort of comes back again and again and again. So like being in that environment where just like the thing you want to do just isn't permitted has been really powerful in terms of internalizing what things mean without like reading a crazy paper that maybe still wouldn't make sense, you know? Sure. One thing I'll kind of add to that is so I, in all of my side projects, I use either Clojure or in Clojure Script or Haskell in, in Pure Script or, and some language that gets me all these benefits, right? The language forces me to do things the right way, um, despite sometimes when I'm, I feel weak and I want to kind of <laughs> fall out the wrong way. Um, but when I'm building stuff at work, it can be a much harder sell to say like, hey, we've been like building this product for a while. Um, we should convert everything to Pure Script. I might feel like that would be really great if we had done that, but like that, that can be really, really hard. So one of the benefits of the mixed model is not just incremental, like what you said before, I super resonate with. The ability to learn things incrementally is extremely important when you're like, you can just do everything the way you were doing, but check it out. Like, did you know that JavaScript arrays have, have this function called map and reduce? Like, learn those first. And then you're like, oh, this is an interesting, interesting way of thinking. And you can kind of see the bits one, one piece at a time, rather than, like, I don't know, the first time I learned Haskell, I was like, an, an, like a non-CS person, like JavaScript programmer. And someone's like, you should really learn Haskell. And I took a class, um, and like, I was, I was lost at minute four. It was like, like everything went over my head. I like and then, like later time. I had to ask him like, what's a monad? And like, you know, four or five hours later over beers, I had finally grokked the idea of a monad and like my brain wow. shifted. And then like the entire world was upside down and like it turned out that, you know, it was upside down all along and now it was right side up. So um, I, I was maybe like a year in when I was like, I think I get this now. Yeah, so how did you do, how did well. you, how did you do well. that in four or five hours? What's, what's uh, going on? <laughs> Because of years of like one step at a time, oh, that's why map is cool, oh, that's why reduce is cool, and like one little thing, oh, that's why nullable types are interesting, you know, it's like, oh, those are all monad, monadic operations, ah, ah, okay, cool, it all clicked for me after a while, yeah. I think beer helped. Um, <laughs> But uh, in, in tandem with incremental learning, I think, is also the ability to incrementally add these ideas to the environment that you're already using. So if you already have built like a big thing and your team has dozens of engineers working on this thing, um, and like you're now enlightened and you want to use functional techniques, it, at the very least, it's hard to convince your team. And even if you convinced your team, like, how, are you going like, to drop the thing on the floor and start over in a new language? That can't be done. Well, and I, I want to like push back a little bit on the idea that you can be enlightened in this way. Like really, really, these are like tools, right? And yes. they either help you make a good thing or like they don't help you enough to be worth it. Yeah. And so one one thing that I've noticed in companies that are sort of starting out using Elm is a lot of them do a process where they're doing something, they find out about React, and they're like, this is amazing, and then there's then there's like, oh well, what's the next piece here? And so I've yet to see 
uh, a company that didn't go through React. And sort of as projects like Redux and Flow become more popular, we see direct impact on how many people are on the mailing list or the website and this kind of thing. So you, you, I, I think it's, it's important to have sort of both halves of this because like this gradual learning curve is really good. And so when people come to Elm and say, what's this map thing? They're like, well, it's like in JavaScript. Um, so I think that's been really, really a huge part of why we're seeing this uptick in functional stuff. Not like it's sort of independent of people who make languages along these lines. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Enlightened was maybe the wrong an word. Another, another piece of this, though, is I've never observed a company that said, this is, I don't like how this is, so let's do a full rewrite. Like, and That's I would, always a terrible idea. I would never recommend that. No, as, yeah, yeah, please don't uh, do know. that. Right, so what people end up doing is uh, uh, choosing a little piece and saying, let's try that in Elm or Clojure or PureScript or whatever it is, and that's how you sort of have a low risk way of trying it out. If it doesn't work, you throw it away. Like, and, and I think if you're trying to do something more intense than that, you're not doing service to like, the yeah, business. Yeah, I think we're saying the same thing, because um, I 100% agree with that. Like, you have to have an incremental way of introducing these things. And whether that's like, you're happy with JavaScript, you want to keep JavaScript, and you just want to introduce the ideas and kind of libraries that help you if as you one. If you like your JavaScript, you can keep your JavaScript. You can keep your JavaScript. <laughs> or, I mean, that's why, like, all the people who are up here talking about, like, new languages, except our empty seat, which is our shout-out for ClojureScript. <laughs> um, but all of these compile to JavaScript, and that's important because they have the facility to speak with JavaScript, enabling exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, and that's, like, a very important and critical and intentional detail. Yeah, is and an another thing Sorry, along these lines is that uh, the sort of JVM functional languages sort of are a couple years ahead of JavaScript ones, so maybe four or five years older than the ones in JavaScript, and I think the main thing there is that like the VM was ready for that kind of pressure earlier in Java Java world, and so we're just starting to see our, our like crop of languages. This is actually the thing I'm most excited about is that as the functional languages push on the JavaScript VMs, the JavaScript VMs uh, kind of reflect that by saying like, oh, people are trying to do it this way. Yeah. We'll make that path faster, yeah. and I'm that excited just reflects that. positively on all the stuff that we're doing. That map proposal. <laughs> hey, uh, I had a question. Is is pri pri wait um, the closure script num? Anybody? Anyway, I was I was hoping that someone was here for closure script that could just come up for a second because I feel so sad. There's an extra seat, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but I think Priatom was not here. So anyway, so Phil, uh, how would you sell pure script to your boss? <laughs> um, so I think you know the most important thing is what we were just saying, right? That um, you can drop an arbitrarily small piece of pure script or any other language alongside, you know, into into a JavaScript application. Uh, that's like the beauty of you know Alt JS and sharing this common, um, you know, this common runtime, right? Is that I can I can pick something that is more suitable for pure script um, and you know and target that and fix that and 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 deploy it, you know, compile it to JavaScript and deploy it. Um, and there's no reason that I couldn't have you know pick the pick the tool that's sort of right most right for the for each individual job, right? Um, but yeah, as far as like the incremental like learning and stuff, um, I, I'd be curious if you could get in there, teach some of the, the JavaScript or some functional stuff, and then take the next step into like Elm or PureScript or something that's a little bit heavier, the GHCJS, <laughs> <You're> crazy. <laughs> um, but yeah, it seems to be a common issue. It's like how are people going to sell this to a, a boss who you know you have a team who doesn't really necessarily know or. Love yeah. the ideas. I mean, the question sort of becomes like, you know, if, if it's so easy to just drop this other language in, then what is the part that I should replace, right? And I think there's plenty of examples, you know, where Haskell, for example, has demonstrated that these ideas make, you know, particular types of jobs much easier. So like, let's say parsing, right? Maybe I have a parsing job that I want to do. Um, and I can just isolate that and, and solve that in pure scripts or Elm or, or what have you. And, and a piece to consider as well as like, um, so I've been writing Haskell code maybe like, six years, seven years now, so like a long time. And uh, it took me, I'm, I'm gonna say like three years before I was like, I know what's going on here. Um, and like once I pass that, like it's an extraordinarily powerful tool. But like part of it is this sort of how can you do the gradual pieces. Um, and so I'd also sort of, the, the question like how would you sell it to a boss is interesting in that I'm not sure if you're s selling it, like maybe a mistake has been made already, right? Like 
if you're on a team where sort of the direction is towards React stuff, people are interested in it, in immutable stuff, like it's not a matter of like selling the idea, it's just like we have these concepts that we like, let's take the next step, which, which I think is a different thing than right. how do we just insert a new paradigm. How do you gradually morph your team into this? You implement the Elm architecture in every language, in every system. <laughs> in every... Well, and one, one thing that I've noticed looking at teams that are using Elm these days is that it, this gradual approach is 100% how it happens. And it's usually on the, the, the companies I've seen, it, at least these days, are smaller teams. So it'll be between two and six people who are on the front end team. And some of them, or like one person is sort of really into Elm and like gets it and sees how to make that transition. And that's the process that happens. And I, I think in, in the cases that I'm aware of, it's not a matter of like how do we sell it, it's just like the structure of the team permits that uh, pathway. Um, and I'll be curious to see as things progress if we do start seeing teams of like 20 move over and what that looks like. I don't know what that process will look like, honestly. Right on, yeah. Um, so that, that kind of leads into the next question. Um, we're seeing uh, like everybody implementing the Elm architecture uh, and everybody getting interested in these ideas. And then um, like we're getting um, immutable stuff. Uh, even Redux kind of looks like a free monad if you squint. <laughs> um, what, we're, we're, we seem to be going to the functional land and stealing ideas and implementing them in JavaScript ourselves. Uh, what, what do you think is next up? Anybody have uh, the next big functional language feature that's going to be in JavaScript? So, so my guess would, I think the core pieces that make functional stuff appealing aren't like new necessarily, right? Like it's like, what if we just had variables and we didn't then change them later? So like we removed a thing. Or what if we had functions and they like didn't have this feature? So to me, like the essence is all in those pieces, and that's I think the part that's most attractive. So I'd be somewhat surprised if like the fancy stuff was really what people got excited about. In that, like in my personal like writing a compiler in Haskell, like the as I would try out a fancy thing, I would find myself months later rolling it back and being like, actually, I sort of overcommitted to an idea that didn't exactly match my FRP. scenario. Huh? It's the FRP. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's, I think this is an idea along these lines where like, I'm not as bullish on that idea as I once was. Um, and I think of it as like, what I thought the idea was wasn't what it turned out to be. But, but there, there is this sort of siren call of like, look at this crazy thing that's like sort of mathematically beautiful in a certain way. Um, but I have a hard time sort of weighing that against, you know, the core idea of like functions are a really powerful abstraction. And to think that we're going to invent something that's sort of better sort of feels weird to me. Right on. There's, there's kind of a few aspects to that question that I think is interesting. So I actually think most of the ideas that are coming out of the functional programming world, like we've, we've successfully built that bridge between the JavaScript-y front-enders world and like the functional programming world. Um, and React has come out of that, and Im immutable data structures have come out of that, and FRP is, is coming out of that. And so we're, we're getting some tools to play with. Um, but that's not the whole picture. You also need the language to kind of help you through that. And JavaScript really is not very good at that. Um, and you need the runtime underneath the language to make that kind of thing efficient. So I think like we've successfully built the bridge between humans so that like ideas are starting to flow. And so that, that part feels good. Um, and we are starting to see the language in the VM start to react. Uh, we have arrow functions. So you know it used to be really annoying to write lambdas in JavaScript. Now it's not annoying. Uh, and so that's like a language level improvement. JavaScript VMs are seeing these kinds of patterns, and they're starting to optimize them. That will have to continue quite a lot. What other language features can we add? Like, should we have value types in JavaScript? Um, you know, should we have immutable data types that are kind of baked into the language? Right now, we only have scalars. It'd be really nice if we had immutable by default value types that we could that we could start to do really interesting things. We could move things between web workers and kind of treat them as like really fat threads. We could do all kinds of really interesting stuff, even as a compiler target. Like, yeah. you put Elm, you put PureScript, you put ClojureScript on top of this stuff. 
you still end up compiling down to JavaScript and you're limited by what that platform can do. Yeah, so this is something that has been like from the very earliest days of Elm. Like I was like, oh, we can have different threads and it'll just communicate really well. And just like JavaScript, like we, you can't do that. I think and this I'm is like, the, but I can do this it. This is the biggest <laughs> existential threat to JavaScript and like, like our ability to survive doing what we're doing uh, is like JavaScript is a single threaded environment and any kind of asynchronicity is really, really hard. We don't have anything that are like threads. Web workers are kind of like threads. They're like some of the good parts, but most of the bad parts. Um, and, and it's actually like the worst possible scenario, right? Like c CPUs are not getting faster, they're just getting more cores. We have no way to take advantage of that. People are like abandoning desktop computers in favor of mobile devices. Actually the most commonly used mobile device around the world is four years old. So it's not even that like as new devices come out, people are getting new device. They're getting older devices because the older ones are getting cheaper. So like if JavaScript is gonna be the platform that propels us for the next 30 years, as Alan mentioned in the previous panel in this room, then we have to come up with some primitives to take advantage of the cores on the processors that we're actually operating on. Well, and I, my personal theory is that the sort of web assembly stuff that's happening is directly sort of influenced by this. That's definitely the most exciting this, like, looking, looking at like death in the eyes where it's like, <laughs> like this is gonna take over the world and like are we gonna be there or not? Um, so like if you wanna be competing with native iOS stuff, like you can't just be like, well, we're just slower. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So you're saying parallelism is still the cell for functional oh. programming. <laughs> it is. So I mean, why doesn't, so to reverse it a little bit, why doesn't JavaScript have primitives for parallelism? The answer is because parallelism is like the biggest foot gun in programming. Right? It's like there are locks and mutexes, and there's mutation and shared mutable straight across threads, and there's race conditions. And like, ask your like, local friendly C programmer like, how many times they've had a parallelism bug, and you're like, oh, that's why we don't do that, because like, we want JavaScript to be the language for the masses, mm -hmm. and so we make that piece removed. We don't want browsers to crash. Like, there's lots of reasons why you would make the trade-off to say, actually, like, a single thread is totally fine. So, so I have a sort of jokey... Uh, idea along these lines. So like if you if you talk with someone who does Java stuff, like they have all the, the abilities to, to do these kinds of crazy things. And in general they don't, right? Like if you in like maybe 80% of cases people are maybe maybe it's higher. I don't know. But I, I had this idea where like to make so I could write a scheduler myself that did this kind of concurrency, it'd be really nice if I had go to. So I was like, what if we added it to <laughs> JavaScript? And yeah that would make JavaScript worse, but that's also good for me, so, <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, just like yeah. a jokey thing, but. Yeah, I, I think it comes back to this idea of like, why is functional good? It's good because it's simple, and like the parallelism comes out of that. Parallelism is possible when things are simple. You can control a lot more, so like, and you add a type system, so it's like, hey, you're mutating that thing here, and then you're using it in another thread, don't do that. Uh, well, Rust is full of really, really cool ideas on yeah. this line. And this is another piece that I, I, I've observed that if you say to JavaScript folks, like, hey, this is faster, forget any other detail, <laughs> like, they're gonna be into that thing. Right. Um, and so I think one of the things that, w w it's a shame we haven't been able to sort of take advantage of as, as much as we could is that when you have a sort of fully type correct programming language where you know this program will work, you'd never have to check, all right, I'd like to add X and Y is x an int, is x a float, is x a string, is x an object, is x an or, okay, is, this is why, it, and go through that on every single one. And like the amount of acrobatics that people go through to like get that to like, let's just add the two numbers, is crazy. And I wonder what kind of speed we'll be seeing when those checks start to sort of be the, to go, I mean, and I wonder if, yeah. if like JavaScript VMs can sort of evolve to a place where that, we can get rid of that kind of I stuff. I hope so. Me too. <laughs> so Evan, you mentioned uh, it'd be really nice if you had GoTo in JavaScript, but isn't there something similar to that? That If it's not GoTo, there's something like that? So, so I've done tricks along these lines where you have... <laughs> some <laughs> Break label? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. so the, the thing is that it doesn't give Makes you the full, the full power in that if you want to jump ahead, you can do it with a certain trick, but if you want to jump around it's not okay, but so so the thing is like, <laughs> if you're if you write compilers, you're like the 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 like ten people who are like go to is pretty useful. <laughs> yeah, um, turns out yeah. that move command's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
But, I mean, this is, so JavaScript, like, it serves two purposes at the same time. It's both a language that we need to use to make real things and is used by tons of people, like computer science PhDs and all the way down to, like, a high schooler who's learning how to program. And you definitely want that to be a nice, safe environment. Uh, I mean, a user who is not programming at all. Yeah, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but at the same time, it serves this purpose as a compiler target, and it's definitely not assembly. Um, even though we might want it to be. So this, I'm, I'm actually super excited about WebAssembly. It, it is like a really encouraging kind of avenue for these things to go. And something else you guys have been mentioning back and forth is having like concurrency primitives or parallelism primitives. But isn't there a, like a pure script library for MVARs or something that, that's something similar? Not quite MVARs, but um, there are sort of like user space. Um, well, there's, there's libraries that you know, build things that look a lot like you know, MVARs and these kinds of things, right? Um, so yeah, I, I'd like to see I'd like to see JavaScript sort of, you know, in terms of like what, fun, what, what things would be best brought over, what features brought over from functional languages to JavaScript. And so instead of um, adding features, I quite like the idea that, you know, JavaScript could sort of stop adding features and concentrate more on, um, you know, being able to implement, you know, things like pure functions and user space abstractions more efficiently. But I don't know how realistic that is. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, the committee response would be like, why not do both? Sure. Right? We've got 10 giant companies pouring hundreds of thousands or billions of dollars, and we'll just, ha we'll just do it all. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we've got a few, like 10 minutes, um, nine minutes, 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> I, I think it'd be good to just talk about, uh, for I am a JavaScript programmer, and I'm interested in functional programming. I see this every single day, not just because I always talk about functional programming. Uh, like most people are really interested in this right now. What do they do? Do they jump head first into you know, uh, Haskell or, or a different language and come back? Or do they, uh, you talked about the gradual learning. Um, for me, uh, just to throw this out there, I found Scala to be quite enlightening as a stepping stone into a more hardcore language. But uh, what, is, is there any thoughts on the JavaScript programmer who wants to learn how to be a functional programmer? Uh, I think there's quite a few nice libraries out there that can help, and you, you don't have to leave JavaScript completely. So uh, RAM is a really good library that I'm, I'm not sure most people are familiar with. But it doesn't uh, force you to go so far out of your comfort zone. There's still a lot of, like, you still have to, like, you can still deal with nulls and undefines and stuff like that. Um, there's other libraries that are a little bit stronger, like Sanctuary. It's, it's kind of like Ramda, but it has, like, your maybes and your eithers and stuff like that. So there's a bunch of libraries out there that can kind of guide you along the path, you know? And you can use however much or however little you, you feel comfortable with. So my suggestion is to kind of hit it from both ends. Like take small things and do them one step at a time. So here's a challenge. For the next month, never write a for loop. And just like, <laughs> you know, it's, you're gonna give up sometimes, but like every time you encounter a for loop, you're like, what am I really trying to do? And that's actually a really good thought exercise for thinking of how you might do something in a different way. But at the same time, you should try new languages. Like, take a class on Haskell, take a class on ML or Scholar or Scheme, um, and see what it feels like to play with those languages. I think pretty fast, as soon as you make like one thing, you're like, man, how did that work? And the first time you encounter something, you're like, uh-oh, I have a list of things, now what? And you can't, use, like, there is no for loop for you to fall back on. What does it look like? You're gonna get all these different views from that different way of thinking, but it's gonna be a slower process. Um, but having the other side where you can kind of take these ideas and like put them into practice immediately in like the code that you're writing today, that, that's how you'll actually feel them out in the context of like real software. Well, so, and the way we think about this in, in Elm, like, like my personal view is I learn by seeing the code and, and playing with it and like changing it. So for me, a lot of it is I want to show you the simplest example and be like, look, it's not, it's not so weird. OK, we're, we're cool, right? And like, let's add a little thing here and add a little thing. So, so really think about what's the simplest possible version of it and sort of gradually introduce more concepts. And I think one thing that looking back was important for me in learning was there were certain concepts that I found scary, such that I was sort of afraid to engage with them in a, like, let's use this to do something kind of way. And only when I finally used it was I was, I was like, oh, it's not crazy. Everyone just said it was crazy for no real useful reason. So, so there's this element of, uh, I think, 
overconfidence is like quite an important way to go into this kind of thing. Just be like, this is, I'm, I'm gonna be able to do this. And once you get your hands on, on something, often that's the case. And if you find yourself in a case where it doesn't make any sense, uh, maybe try something else, right? Like you wanna have this sense of like, this is gonna work. And I think th this is a nice way to sort of get yourself really into, in a, into one of these languages. Maybe another piece is uh, implement some of these ideas yourself. So um, if you're like, hmm, like reduce sounds cool, like what is it doing exactly? Write the reduce function. Um, you know, like pretend you're interviewing yourself or something. Like go to a whiteboard and like, how is this, what is this actually doing, right? Yeah. Type it out in code. And then you'll, you'll have a much better understanding of what these tools are doing for you after you've kind of like written a few of them yourself. And I remember like when I first learned like fold, like reduce in scheme, like I got it and then they were like, okay, now you write it. And then I like didn't get it anymore and I just like <laughs> stared at it for like a week. And then I got it again and like there was this like cycle, but, but you, well, it, you it, probably it was... know more about FRP because you like forced yourself well. through building Elm <laughs> and you're like, oh, like now I understand exactly why you want these things to work the way they do. I mean, yeah, that, that took a couple years. Of as course well, it does. Though. Don't do what he did. <laughs> Uh, but seriously, you know, you take these pieces, you do one piece at a time. So, I don't know, when I was first playing with Elm, I was like, man, folding over time, mind blown. And I was, and it took me a long time to understand that concept, so I, like, wrote one myself. I was like, okay, uh, in JavaScript, I have this, like, RxJS library. What does reduce over time mean? And I just kind of wrote three versions that didn't work, and I finally got one version that did work. And I was like, oh, this is actually not that complicated. And then, like, all kinds of ideas made sense to me after That's that. That's interesting. I, I feel like there's also an element of, like, the culture of JavaScript is this, like, take it, remix it yourself and like learn from that. So I wonder if this is a, a cultural thing because like Maybe. that wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily be the same advice in a different uh, setting. But that, that's that's quite interesting. That is certainly me like speaking to myself and the way that I learn. No, I, I, mean, I learn I, by right by building stuff. So and if you learn by building stuff, build stuff. Yeah. I think uh, it's probably far more enjoyable to sort of if you go into experiment, let's say in a REPL or something with folds, right? It's far more enjoyable to have, you know, use like a fold over time and see an interactive thing happening, right? The web, the web is sort of like a really great playground for like functional ideas and functional programming communities sort of been historically not great at, you know, like Pictures. providing tools to learn these <laughs> things. Um, but yeah, we should probably be taking more advantage of, you know, the web for these, you know, the teaching tool. I think we hit our monad quota earlier, so I won't bring that up. <laughs> Thank you. But uh, we've got last, uh, last minute thoughts. We've got two minutes, so I just want to, does anybody have any thoughts they want to shout out for the last uh, conversation topic? I guess uh, maybe just closing, like hopefully this was some helpful insight and sort of instilled in you either the confidence or overconfidence to start trying stuff out and like see what happens. Like ultimately it's about making your code nicer and you know, if you do some experimentation, I can't imagine you'll come out the other side uh, feeling bad about what you learned. Yeah, I would, and I would add to try to like understand why these features are adding value to you because you're like, oh, like all the cool kids are doing functional, or like I understand at a high level why it's interesting, but I, you know I haven't bothered to learn it yet. For me, at least, it was much more powerful when I saw like in my own code building real stuff how like changing something had some effects like months down the line for maintainability or for ease of, uh, ease of understanding or for performance or for some other uh, reason. Um, having a really clear understanding of what I was getting out of it provided me with the, with the motivation to learn more. And, and one thing I've also noticed is part of why I have this weird love of typed functional stuff is not because of the ideas about it. It's like I wrote a thing and then like it didn't break later and I was like, That's how, so amazing how, does this, how is this happening? Like, what, what's going on here? So, so independent of any like, particular understanding, you'll start to notice these like, huh, this didn't break. And, and like, just on reflecting on that, you'll start to see like, what is this really giving me? I think I would say for anybody that's trying to get into it, like, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I mean, nobody really knows this stuff to start with and, and like, Everybody, you have your, your mentors and stuff that you can talk to and, and get help from, or just the community itself. Um, I mentioned Ramda before, that community is really good. Uh, you mentioned RxJS, that community is also really good. Cycle, really great community. Like there's just a, a bunch of different libraries have, have a good community around them and you can 
ask for help on random stuff. And, and as a cautionary tale, that's excellent advice. So when I was learning Haskell, I sort of learned it on my own for like three years. And at the end, I got everything. But like, had I sat down with someone at any point in those three years, I could have saved a lot of time. So like, just don't be afraid to be like, hey, what's going on here? And by virtue of all these communities being like small and growing, I think it's just a necessity that folks are friendly. So like, no one's going to be a jerk about like, people are excited about these ideas and they want to share them and like, see if you like them too. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of, in San Francisco, there's a lot of meetups that are very, very friendly. People are afraid of functional programmers sometimes, I think, because they're all like, I am a mathematician. But uh, it's uh, not like that at all. So go check it out. All right, well, that's our panel. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, yeah. <laughs>